Welcome back. We are reading Italo Calvino's Complete Cosmic Comics. Notably, we are reading these three short stories narrated by Quiviqua about mitosis, meiosis, and death. Uh, so we just finished reading about mitosis, and now we're going to read about meiosis, fertilization, and the union of selves. Um, so, like the last one, I'm going to read this mostly unabridged, but I will add my commentary where I think it is necessary to add a little bit of context and meaning. Um, this story is a little bit shorter than the first one. Two, meiosis. Narrating things as they are means narrating them from the beginning. And even if I start the story at a point where the characters are multicellular organisms, for example, the story of my relationship with Priscilla, I have to define clearly first what I mean when I say me, and what I mean when I say Priscilla. Then I can go on to establish what this relationship was. So, I'll begin by saying that Priscilla was an individual of my same species and of the sex opposite mine, multicellular, as I find myself too, but having said this, I still haven't said anything, because I must specify that by multicellular individual is meant a complex of about 50 trillion cells, very different, 50 trillion cells, very different among themselves, but marked by certain chains of identical acids in the chromosomes of each cell of each individual, acids that determine various processes in the proteins of the cells themselves, right? So he's talking about multicellular differentiation, that every cell in my body, from my eye cells to my brain cells to my hair cells to my leg cells, although they are very different morphologically, they all contain the same DNA, the same sequence of particular acids inside the chromosomes. So, narrating the story of me and Priscilla means, first of all, defining the relations established between my proteins and Priscilla's proteins, commanded, both mine and hers, by chains of nucleic acids arranged in, ar arranged in identical series in each of her cells and in each of mine. Then, narrating the story becomes still more complicated than when it was a question of a single cell, not, not only because the description of the relationship must take into account so many things that happen at the same time, but above all because it's necessary to establish who is having relations with whom, before specifying what sort of relations they are. Actually, when you come right down to it, defining the sort of relations isn't, after all, as important as it seems. Because saying we have mental relations, for example, or else, for example, physical relations, doesn't change much. Doesn't change much, since a mental relationship involves several billion special cells called neurons, which, however, function by receiving stimuli from such a great number of other cells that we might as well, that we might as well just as well consider all the trillions of cells in the organism at once, as we do when we talk about a physical relationship. So, again, Calvino is being very firm here that the mind-body distinction does not exist. It's all mental stuff. It's all physical stuff. It's all the same stuff. But that doesn't mean that the mind doesn't exist. That doesn't mean that there isn't a self within the self. And that's what DNA is. It's a self within the self. But these kind of selfhoods, they're all about relationships. They're all about processes going on between one thing and another thing. Um, so it doesn't make sense to make a differentiation. Oh, this is a mental process, and this is a physical process. It's all physical process. It's all mental process. It's all the same thing. It's the process that's important, not the, the kind of thing that you want to qualify it as. All right, moving on. In saying how difficult it is to establish who's having relations with whom, we must first clear the decks of a subject that often crops up in conversation, namely, the fact that from one moment to the next I am no longer the same, nor is Priscilla any longer the same Priscilla, because of the continuous renewal of the protein molecules in our cells, though, for example, digestion, through, for example, digestion, or also respiration, which fixes the oxygen in the bloodstream. Right, so this is the you-can't-step-in-the-same-river-twice thing. Um, this kind of argument takes us completely off our course, because while it's true that the cells are renewed, in renewing themselves they go on following the program established by those that were there before. And so, in this sense, you could reasonably insist that I continue to be I, and Priscilla, Priscilla. This, in other words, is not the problem, but perhaps it was of some use to raise it, because it helps us realize that things aren't as simple as they seem, and so we, and so we slowly approach the point where we will realize how complicated they are. Right, so this is this, this question about self, right? Everything about your body is changing. Your matter is constantly repeating itself and rearranging itself and replacing itself. And yet somehow, through all of that material transformations, you 
remain the same? And this is the issue. What is, it, what is the thing that remains the same when everything else changes? This is the question. Well, well then, when I say I, or when I say Priscilla, what do I mean? I mean that specific configuration which my cells and her cells assume through a special relationship between the environment and a special generic heritage from which the beginning seemed to be invented on purpose to cause my cells to be mine and Priscilla's cells to be Priscilla's. <laughs> Let me read that once again. I mean that special configuration which my cells and her cells assume through a special relationship between the environment, right, the environment causes you to be you, and a special generic heritage, your genes also cause you to be you. But really what you are is the relationship between the environment and the genes. That relationship, that relationship which from the beginning seems to be invented on purpose to cause my cells to be mine and Priscilla's cells to be Priscilla's. As we proceed, we'll see that nothing is made that well, as we proceed, we'll see that nothing is made on purpose, that nobody has invented everything, and that the way I am and Priscilla is really doesn't matter in the least to anyone. All a generic all a genetic heritage has to do is to tr <sighs> tongue twister. I need to have better diction. All a genetic heritage has to do is to transmit what was transmitted to it for transmitting and not giving a damn about how it's received. Right, so this is Dawkins' ideas about um, vehicles, genetic vehicles, mimetic vehicles, that like what our bodies are are vehicles for our genes to be transmitted from one place to another. Uh, which is, is not quite true, but it makes a really good sentence. That uh, I'll read it once again. All a genetic heritage has to do is to transmit what was transmitted to it for transmitting, and not give a damn about how it's received, right? So the phenotype doesn't matter, because the phenotype is constantly changing. The only thing that matters is the, the core thing, the thing that remains unchanged throughout all of those transformations. The thing that is transmitted to it for transmitting, and all that matters is that it gets transmitted, not what happens in between. But for the moment, let's limit ourselves to answering the question if I, in quotes, and Priscilla, in quotes, are our genetic heritage, in quotes, or our form, in quotes. This is the question. Are you the sum of your genes? And when I say form, or... Oh, no, no, hold on. That's not the question. <laughs> for the moment, let's limit ourselves to answering the question if I, in quotes, and Priscilla, in quotes, are our genetic heritage, in quotes, or are our form, in quotes. Right? Are you genes, or are you something more than genes? And when I say form, I mean both what is seen and what isn't seen, namely all her ways of being Priscilla. In fact, the fuchsia or orange the fact that fuchsia or orange is becoming to her, the scent emanating from her skin, not only because she was born with a glandular constitution suited to giving off that scent, but also because of everything she has eaten in her life, and the brands of soap she has used. In other words, because of what is called cult, called in quotes culture and also her way of walking and sitting down which becomes her to, which which and also her way of walking and sitting down which comes to her from the way she has moved among those who move in the cities and houses and streets where she's lived all this but also the things she has in her memory after having seen them perhaps just once perhaps at the movies and also the forgotten things which still remain recorded somewhere in the back of the neurons like all the psychic trauma a person has to swallow from infancy on so here's the question, you know, are we, are we just genetic vehicles ferrying our genes around, or are we more than that? Are we our form? And our form is the way we smell and the way we look, and it comes from our glands and the way our glands secrete smells, but also from the soaps that we use and the things that we eat and all of the things which constitute culture. So here's this question of culture. Where does the self lie? And can it be said that it lies in our culture? I think it does. I think the huge majority of who we think we are comes not from our genes, but from the cultural environment that we are embedded in, from books like this. This book makes me who I am, because in reading it, I am affected, and my perceptions of myself change, right? That means that who I am is somehow encoded in these words, just a little bit. But let's move on. Now, both in the form you see and don't see, and in our genetic heritage, Priscilla and I have absolutely identical elements, right? So for all of the information that makes us up, the genes, the culture, the, the environment, all the things, there's a lot that Priscilla and I that have that are absolutely identical, common to the two of us, or to the environment, or to the species, things like having feet, having eyes. 
and also elements which establish a difference, things like having red hair, having blonde hair. The problem begins to arise where the relationship, whether the relationship between me and Priscilla is a relationship only between the differential elements, because the common ones can be overlooked in both. That is, whether by Priscilla we must understand what is peculiar to Priscilla as far as other members of the species are concerned, or whether the relationship is between the common elements, and then we must decide if it's the ones common to the species, or to the environment, or to the two of us distinct from the rest of the species, and perhaps more beautiful than the others. So where does individuality lie? Right? Is it, is it only in the things that make you completely unique? Is that, is that what makes you you? <laughs> it's just the things that are unique to you? Or am I me because I am a human? You know, and I've got a nose and a mouth and a brain and I speak English and all these things that I share with lots of other people. Does, does that make me me? What makes me me? I don't know. On closer examination, if individuals of opposite sex enter into, into a particular relationship, it clearly isn't we who decide, but the species, right? I couldn't procreate with a camel. It wouldn't work. <laughs> I can only procreate with other, with other female humans, only have children with other female humans. I could procreate with, um, I don't know. Well, what does that word mean, procreate? Anyway, um, on closer examination, if individuals of the opposite sex enter into a particular relationship, it clearly isn't we who decide, but the species, or rather, not so much the species as the animal condition, or the vegetable animal condition, of the animal vegetatives distinguished into distinct sexes. Now, in the choice I make of Priscilla to have with her relations whose nature I don't yet know, and in the choice that Priscilla makes of me, assuming that she does not choose me and doesn't, uh, assuming that she does choose me and doesn't change her mind at the last moment, no one knows what order of priority comes first into play. Therefore, no one knows how, how many eyes precede the eye that I think I am, and how many Priscillas precede the Priscillas towards whom I believe I'm running, right? We are our history in a very, very important way. And I'll get to that more in a moment after I take this sip of water. In short, the more you simplify the terms of the question, the more they become complicated. Once we've established that what I call I consists of a certain number of amino acids which line up in a certain way, it's logical that inside these molecules all possible relations are foreseen. He's talking about genetic determinism here. And from outside, we have nothing but the exclusion of some of the possible relations in the form of certain enzymes which block certain processes. Therefore, you can say that it's as if everything possible has already happened to me, including the possibility of it's not happening. Once I am I, the cards are all dealt. I dispose of a finite number of possibilities and no more. What happens outside counts for me only if it's translated into operations already foreseen in my nucleic acids. I'm walled up within myself, chained to my molecular program. Outside of me, I don't have and won't have relations with anything or anybody, and neither will Priscilla. I mean the real Priscilla, poor thing. If around me and around her there's some stuff that seems to have relations with other stuff, these facts don't concern us. In reality, for me and for her, nothing substantial can happen. Right, so he's talking about genetic determinism, and then he's talking about this thing, Umwelt, that we, I mentioned in the previous video a little bit. That, you know, like, oak trees can't respond to stop signs. Even though the stop signs are there, they can't perceive them, right? They're, the genetic hand that they have been dealt allows them to respond to some things and not others. And so those other things might as well not exist. Um, and so this, this gives us on a very slippery slope of saying that all we are is our genes and everything has already been predetermined and there's no free will and we're just giant machines and, and it all gets very depressing. Um, but then, so there's that. And then there's this notion of, of built reality, that the things that our body is constrains and defines the reality that we live in. Um, he's going to reject this idea in a moment, but it's, it's important to present it. Uh, and to, to recognize why, why it is a compelling idea to think, even if it's also a very disturbing idea to think. Moving on. Hardly a cheerful situation. Therefore, and not because I was expecting to have a more complex individuality than the one given me, beginning with a special arrangement of acids and a four basic substances, which are there, which in their turn, let me go back. 
And not because I was expecting to have a more complex individuality than the one given me, beginning with a special arrangement of an acid and four basic substances which in their turn command the disposition of about 20 amino acids in the 46 chromosomes of each cell I have, not because of all that determinism, but because this individuality repeated in each of my cells is mine only after a manner of speaking, since out of the 46 chromosomes, 23 came to me from my father, and 23 came from my mother. That is, I continue carrying my parents with me in all of my cells, and I'll never be able to free myself of this burden. That's an interesting idea. So what you are is not really what you are, it's just what your parents gave you. And what your parents are isn't really what they are, but what their parents gave them on and on and on forever. And so everything was determined from the very first moment. What my parents programmed me to be in the beginning is what I am, that and nothing else. And in my parents' instructions are contained the instructions of my parents' parents, handed down in turn from parent to parent in an endless chain of obedience. The story I wanted to narrate, therefore, is not only impossible to narrate, but first of all impossible to live, because it's all there already, contained in a past that can't be narrated since, in turn, it's included in its own past, in the many individual pasts, so many that we can't really be sure there aren't the pa that, that we can't really be sure they aren't the past of the species, and of what existed before the species, a general past to which all individual pasts refer, but which no matter how far you go back, doesn't exist except in the form of individual cases, such as Priscilla and I might be, between which, however, nothing happens, individual or general. So that's that's an interesting idea. <laughs> fate. How much of who you are are you because it's what your parents gave you? A great deal. Not everything, I don't think, right? And I think that's the point that he's about to come to. It's not everything about who we are is what our parents gave us, but a substantial portion. So, you know, what, what role does fate play? What role does history play in our identities? Hmm. What each of us is and has is the past. All we are and have is the catalog of the possibilities that didn't fail, of the experiences that are ready to be repeated. A present doesn't exist. We proceed blindly towards the outside and the afterwards, carrying out an established program which ma with materials we fabricate ourselves, always the same. We don't tend towards any future. There's nothing awaiting us. We're shut within the system of a memory which foresees no task but remembering itself. We're shut within the system of a memory which foresees no task but remembering itself. What now leads me and Priscilla to seek each other isn't an impulse towards the afterwards. It's the final action of the past that is fulfilled through us. Goodbye, Priscilla. Our encounter, our embrace are useless. We remain distant or finally near. In other words, forever apart. Separation. The impossibility of meeting has been in us from the very beginning. Here's an interesting idea. We were born not from a fusion, but from a juxtaposition of distinct bodies. Two cells grazed each other. One is lazy and all pulp, an egg. The other is only a head and a darting tail. They are egg and seed. They experience a certain timidity. Then they rush at their different speeds and hurry towards each other. The seed plunges headlong into the egg. The tail is left outside. The head, all full of nucleus, is shot at the nucleus of the egg, and the two nuclei are shattered. You might expect heaven knows what fusion or mingling or exchange of cells, but instead, what was written in one nucleus and in the other, those spaced lines fall in and arrange themselves on each side in the new nucleus, very closely printed. The words of both nuclei fit in whole and clearly separate. In short, nobody was lost in the other, nobody has given in or has given himself. The two cells now are packaged together, but just as they were before, the first thing they feel is a slight disappointment. Meanwhile, no, before we get into meanwhile, let's go into that. So, what he's talking about is when fertilization occurs, you've got 23 chromosomes from the sperm and 23 chromosomes from the egg, and those two cells fuse, but the actual genetic material doesn't. It all gets packaged up in the nucleus, but it's very well defined which 
chromosomes come from the mother and which chromosomes come from the father. So this promise of fusion, of transcending yourself, breaking those self boundaries, never actually gets fully completed upon fertilization because the mother and the father are still completely distinct entities within the cell. And they will, you know, they will have, each will have their own dominance or recessive traits that will control the way the phenotype of the cell is expressed, but the mother and the father remain completely separate throughout the cycle of the cell. Interesting point. Um, in short, nobody was lost in the other. Nobody has given in or has given himself. The two cells now are one, packaged together, but just as they were before. The first thing they feel is a slight disappointment. Meanwhile, the double nucleus has begun its sequence of duplications, printing the combined messages of father and mother in each of the offspring cells, perpetuating not so much the union as the unbridgeable distance that separates each couple, the two, each, in, the, uh, perpetuating the unbridgeable distance that separates in each couple the two companions, the failure, the void that remains in the midst of even the most successful couple. So that's an interesting metaphor for marriage, I suppose, or, you know, the way that, that couples retain their individuality even as they've fused. And what does that mean? I don't know what it means. I'm asking you questions so that you can think about them and then answer them later. All right. <laughs> of course, on every disputed issue, our cells can follow the other following... So, disputed issues, right? So sometimes the genes of the mother are going to be different from the father. So, of course, on every disputed issue, our cells can follow the instructions of a single parent, and thus feel free of the other's command. But we know what we claim to be in our exterior form counts for little compared to the secret program we carry printed in each cell. That's interesting. I'm going to read that again. Of course, on every disputed issue, our cells can follow the, instruct the instructions of a single parent, and thus feel free of the other's command. But we know what we claim to be in our exterior form counts for little compared to the secret program we carry printed in each cell, where the contradictory orders of the father and mother continue arguing. What really counts is this incompatible quarrel of father and mother that each of us drags after him, with the rancor of every point where one partner has to give way to the other, who then raises his voice still louder in his victory as a dominant mate. So the characteristics that determine my interior and exterior form, when they are not the sum or the average of the orders received from father and mother together, or the orders denied in the depths of the cells, counterbalanced by different orders which have remained latent, sapped by the suspicion that perhaps the other orders were better. So at times I'm seized with uncertainty as to whether I really am the sum of the dominant characteristics of the past, as the result of the series of operations which always produced a number bigger than zero, or whether instead my true essence isn't rather what descends from the succession of defeated characteristics, the total of the terms with the minus sign, of everything that was in the tree of derivations has remained excluded, stifled, interrupted, the weight of what hasn't been weighs on me, no less crushing than what has been, or what couldn't not be. So that's another take on this question of where is the self, right? We have, each one of us has a number of recessive characteristics that will never be expressed because the dominant characteristics overwhelms them, but they're still in us. They still constitute us in some way. So, so what are we? Are we the sum of everything that we are? Again, this physical form question, or are we the some of everything that we could be, potentially, you know, what, what role do latent characteristics that have no physical expression play in who we are and who we become and who we give birth to? This is, this is the question of many questions. Void. Separation and waiting, that's what we are. And such we remain even on the day when the past inside us rediscovers its original forms clustering into swarms of seed cells, or concentrated ripening of the egg cells. And finally, the words written in the nuclei are no longer the same as before, but are no longer a part of us either. So now he's talking about meiosis. They're a message beyond us, which already belongs to us no more. In a hidden path, in a hidden point in ourselves, the double series of orders from the past is divided in two, and the new selves, and the new cells find themselves with a simple past, no longer double, which gives them lightness and the illusion of being really new, 
of having a new past which almost seems a future. So, he said something very quickly, which I'll get into in more detail in a moment, but he's talking about meiosis, where the number of chromosomes is halved, and a blend occurs between the mother maternal chromosomes and the paternal chromosomes. So let's, let's see what he says about it, because he says it so much better than I do. Now, I've said it hastily like this, but it's a complicated process. There, in the darkness of the nucleus, in the depth of the sex organs, a succession of phases, some a bit jumbled with others, but from which there's no turning back. At first, the pairs of maternal and paternal messages, which thus far had remained separate, seem to remember their couples, and they join together two by two. So many fine little threads that become interwoven and confused. The desire to copulate outside myself now leads me to copulate within myself, at the depths of the extreme roots of the matter I'm made of, to couple the memory of the ancient pair I carry within me. The first couple, that is both the one that comes immediately before me, mother and father, and the absolute first one, the couple at the animal-vegetal origins of the first coupling on Earth and so the 46 filaments that an obscure and secret cell bears in the nucleus are knotted two by two, still not giving up their old disagreement, since in, since in fact they immediately try to disentangle themselves, but remain stuck at some point in the knot. So when, in the end, they do succeed with a wrench in separating, because meanwhile the mechanism of separation has taken possession of the whole cell, stretching out its pulp, each chromosome discovers it's changed, made of segments the fr that first belonged to some to that made of segments that first belonged some to one and some to the other it moves from the other now changed to marked by the alternate exchanges of the segments and already two cells are being detached each with 23 chromosomes the chromosomes in one cell different from those in the other and and in each case different from those that were in the previous cell and at the next doubling there will be four cells all different each with 23 chromosomes, in which what was the father's and the mother's, or rather, the father's and mother's, is mingled. So, this is a very interesting idea, that when you were made, there was a fertilization event between your mother and your father, and the genetic material in your mother and father fused. But although it fused, it remained separate the entire time, 23 on one side, 23 on the other, and in you there was sort of a constant battle being waged between dominant and recessive traits that your mother or father gave you. And it's only with gametogenesis, this act of meiosis, that the true fusion actually takes place, right? This is called crossing over, where chromosomes exchange segments, little legs from one chromosome will go to the other. and so. It's only when you have sex, when you make gametes, that the sexual event which created you between your mother and father actually reaches its logical conclusion, where the genetic material of your mother and your father actually fuses and mingles to create a truly new individual, a truly new genetic makeup. Um, so that's, that's a very powerful idea to ponder and conceptualize in your head. And, you know, he, he makes, Quifico is making this point that it isn't just your parents that you are then mingling with, but, but this entire lineage of self blending with self that inevitably led to you, but also reaches way, way back in time before there were humans or monkeys or mammals or dinosaurs, all the way back to the unicellular ancestor that we started with in mitosis. And the constant permutations of self that go from that to you form a full line, a, few, a full lineage. And that's, I think, a very, very valuable thing to keep in mind uh, when we encounter the stresses of day-to-day of -day life. So I'm going to continue on now. So finally, the encounter of the pasts, which can never take place in the present, of those who believe they are mating, right? It doesn't take place when your parents are mating. It only takes place when you are mating. So finally, the encounter of the past, which can never take place in the present of those who believe they are meeting, does take place in the form of the past of him who comes afterwards and cannot live that encounter in his own present. <sighs> so finally, the encounter of the past, which can never take place in the present of those who believe they are meeting, does take place in the form of the past of whom who comes afterwards and who cannot live that encounter in his own present. 
We believe we, we are going towards our marriage, but it is still the marriage of our fathers and mothers which is celebrated through our expectation and our desire. What seems to us our happiness is perhaps only the happiness of the other's story, which ends just as we thought ours began. What seems to us our happiness is perhaps only the happiness of the other's story, which ends just where we thought ours began. And it's pointless for us to run, Priscilla, to meet, and it's pointless for us to run, Priscilla, to meet each other and follow each other. The past disposes of us with blind indifference, and once it has moved those fragments of itself and of us, it doesn't bother afterwards how we spend them, right? All that matters is that the message gets, for transmitting gets transmitted. We were only the preparation, the envelope, for the encounter of pasts which happened through us, but which is already part of another story the story of the afterwards. The encounters always take place before and after us, and in them the elements of this new forbidden to us, and in them the elements of the new forbidden to us are active, chance, risk, improbability. This is how we live, not free, but surrounded by freedom, driven, acted on by this constant wave, which is the combination of the possible cases and which passes through which is the combination of the possible cases and which passes through those points of space and time in which the range of the pasts is joined to the range of the futures. One more time there. This is how we live, not free, but surrounded by freedom, driven, acted on by this constant wave which is the combination of the possible cases and which passes through those points of space and of time in which the range of the pasts is joined to the range of the futures. The primordial sea was a soup of beringed molecules traversed at intervals by the messages of the similarly and of the of the similar the primordial sea was a soup of beringed molecules traversed at intervals by the messages of the similarity and of the difference that surrounded us and imposed new combinations. So the ancient tide rises at intervals in me and in Priscilla, following the course of the moon. So the sect, spe so the sext species respond to the old conditioning which prescribes ages and seasons of loves, and also grants extensions and postponements to the ages and the seasons at the time, and at times becomes involved in obstinacies and coercions and vices. In other words, Priscilla and I are only meeting places for messages from the past, not only for messages among themselves, but for messages meeting answers to messages. And as the different elements and molecules and, and as the different elements and molecules answer messages in different ways, imperceptibly or boundlessly different, so the messages vary according to the world that receives them and interprets them. Or else, to remain the same, they are forced to change. That's a line. Right? And as the different elements and molecules answer messages in different ways, imperceptibly or boundlessly different, so the messages vary in the world that receives them and interprets them. Or else, to remain the same, they are forced to change. To remain the same, they are forced to change. So this is the, the question of identity, right? What are you? Everything you are is forced to change. Your body changes, your history changes, the world changes. And all of, we are flexible, you know, when it gets hot, we take off our clothes, when it gets cold, we put on a coat, all these things. We change all of these things so that something can remain the same, right? So, so, you know, <laughs> you might say that, or what is it, to remain the same, they are forced to change, you know, the, that's, I've, I've lost my train of thought here, but it's just that, this is, this is so, so important. <laughs> I am what remains the same when everything is forced to change. You might say, then, that the messages are not messages at all, that a past to transmit doesn't exist, and that only so many futures exist which correct the course of the past, which give it form to invent it, right? So now he's giving the opposite of genetic... Now he's giving us the opposite of genetic determinism. It's not that the we are just the sum of the past messages, but the past messages themselves can only be given meaning when we look at what occurs in the future, right? So, you know, this isn't a philosophy piece. He's not actually trying to make any claims. He's just jumping around all these different positions to try to give us an idea of what it is like to be alive <laughs> and how do, how do we understand ourselves in this world. 
Hmm. Okay. Take a breath. <laughs> so the messages vary according to the world that receives them and interprets them. Or else, to remain the same, they are forced to change. You might say, then, that the messages are not messages at all, that a past to transmit them doesn't exist, and that only so many futures exist which correct the course of the past, which give it form, which invent it. The story I wanted to tell is the encounter of two individuals who don't exist, since they are definable only with regard to the past or the future, a past and a future whose reality is reciprocally doubted. So he can't tell the story. <laughs> or else, it's a story that cannot be separated from the story of all the rest of what exists, and therefore from the story of what doesn't exist, and not existing cause what does exist to exist, right? So this is the thing about evolution. Evolution is a negative logic. I exist in the form that I exist in because of all the other forms that failed, right? Evolution isn't selection for, right? You don't select for things. You select against traits. And what's left is what's left. And that has a certain kind of functionality to it. Um, so the story I wanted to tell is the encounter of two individuals who don't exist since they are definable only with regard to a past or a future, a past and future whose reality is reciprocally doubted. Or else, it's a story that cannot be separated from the story of all the rest of what exists, and therefore from the story of what doesn't exist, and not existing causes what does exist to exist. All we can say is that in certain points and moments the interval of void, which is our individual presence, is grazed by the wave of what of which... <clears throat> One moment. My mouth is dry. All we can say is that in certain points and moments that interval. <sighs> this is hard, guys. <laughs> All we can say is that in certain points and moments, that interval of void which is our individual presence is grazed by the wave which continues to renew the combinations of molecules and complicate them or erase them. Hmm. I'm going to go back one more time. <laughs> Sorry. Or else it's a story that cannot be separated from the story of, of all the rest of what exists, and therefore from the story of what doesn't exist, and not existing causes what does exist to exist. All we can say is that in certain points and moments, that interval of void, which is our individual presence, is grazed by the wave which continues to renew the combinations of molecules and complicate them or erase them. And this is enough to give us the certitude that somebody is I, and somebody is Priscilla, in the temporal and spatial distribution of the living cells, and that something happens, or has happened, or will happen, which involves us directly, and I would dare say happily and totally. Right? So, he's talking about evolutionary history. All we can say is that the past has informed what we are, and what we are not, and all of that, tied up together, makes me definably me. And this is enough to give us the certitude that somebody is I, and somebody is Priscilla, in the temporal and spatial distribution of living cells, and that something happens, or has happened, or will happen, which involves us directly, and I would dare say happily, and totally. And this is in itself enough, Priscilla, to cheer me, when I bend my outstretched neck over yours, and give you a little nip on your yellow fur, and you dilate your nostrils, bare your teeth and kneel on the sand, lowering your hump to the level of my breast so that I can lean on it and press you from behind, bearing down on my rear legs. Oh, how sweet those sunsets in the oasis you remember when they loosen the burden from the pack saddle and the caravan scatters and we camels feel suddenly light and you break into a run and I trot after you, overtaking you in the grove of the palm tree. All along you thought he was a human? No. Quivico is a camel. And a unicellular organism. Alright. So that was meiosis. Thanks for reading that story with me. There's one more story about death, which we will get to next time. I'll see you then.